Hi, we're out on our range today, and once again, no, you haven't won a prize. That's a scam. Now, today is our 2023 Thanksgiving special, and for those who haven't tuned into the Thanksgiving special before, what we do is we make an extra long presentation where we actually intentionally make it longer for those of you who are either A, at home by yourselves and bored because you don't want to watch football all day, or B, at home with the family and you're trying to hide from them. So, for example, you're watching this presentation and someone says, hey, can you bring in the extra chairs? Yeah, sure. Just wait till this video is over. So we're going to help you alleviate holiday boredom or hide from your family. Now, right about now, it's still brunch time and I'm getting a little hungry. So let's start with cooking something. Anytime we're doing Dutch oven cooking, there's two things you have to remember. First, we start with getting our charcoal burning. And second, everything we do when it comes to cooking has to be done in real time and there's no do-overs. So you're going to have to put up with my Shatner-esque pauses and tripping over words and knocking things over and whatever else I would typically edit out. So we start with getting some charcoal going. And when you put the charcoal in this charcoal chimney, you got to put something under it to burn. So we'll use one of our targets and get some paper going. Now, I've got this thing called a fire puck, and it's this puck of sawdust coated with paraffin. And one of them will burn for a long time, so we're just going to use a quarter of one. But it can be difficult to get it started. So I know it seems odd that we need paper to start our fire starter, but these things can be difficult to get started. It also just so happens that the ambient temperature right here right now is about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And that can make it more difficult to get a fire going than if it were, say, 75 degrees. Put that down on there. And that looks like it's going to fire up just fine. Okay, let's make some ingredients. We're going to start with making some biscuits, but before we even do that, for those who haven't tuned into the last couple of presentations and haven't seen this, Short version is, a while ago I broke my hip, don't ask. Okay, what we're making today will be some biscuits, but they're going to be a little bit different. I'm going to add cinnamon and sugar to them, and so I call them cinnamon and sugar biscuits. Now that's going to start with putting some flour in here. And with this canned flour, it is of course imperative that you find both desiccant packs. There's one desiccant pack and the other one is typically smaller. And I won't use this whole can. Both desiccant packs. Okay. Now, we're also going to use, in place of shortening, just some margarine. And this particular stick of margarine has been out here in this temperature, so it's fairly cold, and it'll be good to grease our pan. Now, I know some people get very upset that I'm using margarine instead of butter, and they'll tell me that, oh, margarine is only one molecule away from plastic and blah, blah, blah. Okay, you might have a point, but really for cooking purposes and greasing the pan purposes, margarine does work better. We will, when we're done, we will put butter on the biscuits. All righty. Now, as far as cutting the margarine into the mixture, 
it's better if it's warmed up a little bit. And so yes, I just had this one in my pocket. No, I'm not really happy to see you. And we'll put in some salt. And it's very important that you put in salt, but not very much. Baking powder. My cork kind of crumbled a little, so you got to make sure you're not getting any cork bits in your mixture. That's something that isn't typically a problem, but is here today. And we'll put in some sugar. There we go. And just a little, and I mean just a little bit of cinnamon. All right, then we'll use our pastry blender, and as you've heard me say before, a pastry blender is not for blending pastry, it's for cutting in. That's what I learned in public school. Of course, that was the same public school that taught me a few other things that come to find weren't really correct, such as my brother was in grade school and was learning about Lewis and Clark. He comes home one day talking about what he had learned that day was that when the Lewis and Clark expedition got to the Great Lakes, they thought they'd reached the ocean until they tasted the water and discovered it was fresh water. Yes, that's really what he learned in public school. And I could go on all day about that. But remember, the purpose of today's presentation is to alleviate holiday boredom, not to depress you with the state of our public school system. Okay. I get this all mixed in. And we're cutting it in. Now, we want to take a moment and wipe off the pastry blender. We'll, we'll wash it later, but for right now we wipe it off a little bit, otherwise that stuff will stick on there. Okay, then we add our milk. Use a fork to mix that in. Mixy, 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 mixy. And because I used some sugar in our biscuit dough, the consistency can be a little different than just the typical biscuit dough. This never will get to really the state where I can knead it like I can typical biscuit dough, but we'll get it close. Okay. And that's not bad. Now, while I've got the flour right here handy, we'll put a little. In. Normally we don't have to put very much 
into the Dutch oven. Blowing like that will spread it around and get it a little more even. There we go. Now the real thing of our cinnamon and sugar biscuits is that we take this bowl and we put some sugar in it. Here's where we put in a generous amount of cinnamon. Then we'll also add, and this will depend on people's individual taste, but I'm going to add some cloves to this. You want to be conservative when putting in cloves, because it doesn't take much to get more than what a lot of people would like. Okay. Then we mix that. Get all the lumps out of that sugar. There we go. And now, Take our biscuits, roll them up into a ball, it's about, about that big, and grind that down into the cinnamon and sugar. Now typically when I make things like this at home, I'll just roll it and get it covered completely, but to avoid sticking in this case, we just want to get the cinnamon sugar on the top and sides of the biscuits. Roll that around in there on the top and the sides. And when we put these in our pan, in our Dutch oven, typically we put a little space between the biscuits. In this case, note, we want them right next to each other. This process can be time consuming, made more so by having to lean on this crutch, but things are what they are, so just bear with me. Remember I said we had to do things in real time? Yeah, that was me shaking the table and the Dutch oven lid falling on the ground. Again, sometimes things are what they are. Now, some of you have probably seen something like this being made before. And you may know it as a name that's perhaps a little more creative and a little less descriptive than cinnamon and sugar biscuit. And different people have different names for this type of thing. But you gotta remember that The main thing we want to do here is we want people to eat it and we want people to like it. 
So you got to give it a name that's going to foster that kind of mentality. I was making this one time and someone saw it and he said that he had learned this as being called monkey bread. I don't think I'd want to eat monkey bread. So you got to give it a name that isn't something like sugar-coated sweaty balls or something like that. Okay, you get all these in here. Then, let's take some of our cinnamon and sugar mix. Sprinkle over the top. Then, we go over here and see if I can retrieve the lid. Which luckily fell right side up or upside down, depending on how you look at it. So I don't have to wipe a bunch off. And let's get this on the heat. And our charcoal is doing pretty well. Remember, we always want a lot more heat on top than we do on the bottom. However, because the ground here is a little wet and a little frozen, we'll put a little little more heat on the bottom than we typically do. We also have not much but just a little bit of breeze and that can most certainly affect the, dis the diffusion or distribution of heat. Then we put some charcoal on the top. And because the breeze is blowing this direction, I'm going to put a few charcoals out here on the side, which many people will say is useless, but that way when the heat blows it, you'll get the heat blowing this way and we create a heat force field around the Dutch oven, which I think is a term that I invented about a week ago. Okay. And we'll start with timing that for 18 minutes. And then we'll see how we do. Okay, it's been about 18 minutes. So let's take our lid off. Always being careful not to get any charcoal dust in whatever it is you're baking. And then we'll take our high-tech knife and test. And they are not done probably going to need about seven more minutes. So, put the lid back on. Turn that 180 degrees just to account for whatever uneven distribution of heat there might be. Kick some of these coals under there. And give that a few more minutes. Okay, it's been about seven more minutes. Let's check again. Remember, if I check and it's not done yet, eh, we can put it back on. But if it's overdone, eh, you're kind of out of luck. And these are still not done, although they are a lot closer. So we'll give that a few more minutes. And what I may have to do is fire up a little bit more charcoal and put some more heat on it. Okay, I put some more heat on there, gave it a few more minutes. Now let's check. There we go, that looks pretty good. There we go, that is pretty good. So, remember, when it comes to Dutch ovens, that cast iron will hold a lot of heat. So, when I take this off the charcoal, that might still continue to bake for a few minutes. So, sometimes you can actually leave things just slightly underdone when you take them off the heat, or if it's completely done when you take it off the heat, you might want to get it out of the pan fairly soon. So let's take this over to the table and see how they turned out. Now I have the Dutch oven on this cardboard so the legs of the Dutch oven don't melt a hole through the table. Take our lid off. And 
always the first is difficult to get out. Once you get past that, you can... Okay, that is cooked all the way through. Not burned on the bottom, not stuck. Nice and warm. Okay. Notice I'm going to put butter on the biscuit, not margarine. Put some butter on there. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, remember I haven't eaten anything today except a bowl of cereal about four hours ago. So I'm kind of hungry. That's always going to affect the evaluation. But these turned out really well. And you know what would go good with this? Some milk. I'm gonna have to say that turned out really well. Let's try something else. Okay, now that we've had breakfast, or at least a breakfasty type of snack, we have to look forward to the end of the day of what we're gonna eat after dinner. So, let's make a cake. Now, what we're going to use is Betty Crocker's Super Moist Cake Mix, yellow, and it will be the basis of our pineapple upside down cake. So we'll put the cake mix in the mixing bowl. Very important, don't just throw the box in the fire until you've got the cake made because there's instructions on there. But before we mix up anything, we've got to put our pineapple into our Dutch oven. Now, of course, I've already started the charcoal. I figured you didn't need to sit through seeing me do that again. Now, this pineapple juice, some people drink it, some people will keep it, some people will do whatever. But if we don't drain that off, then all that happens is you get a lot of wetness under your cake. So I'm gonna dump that in the Dutch oven. And if you spread that out a little bit, some people might think that's enough. It isn't. So let's take a second can. Drain that. Imagine the embarrassment when I'm cooking in the kitchen and just dump this on the floor before I realize what I'm doing. Now, when you put two cans of pineapple in there, most people are going to look at that and say, that's plenty. It isn't. You really need more. You don't want it to be like pork and beans where they say there's pork, but there's only that one little piece. You don't want to have a cake with a few pieces of pineapple. No, you really want a pineapple cake, or at least I do. So. That'll be enough. Now, another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of molasses. Yeah, it's cold out here today, so the molasses have been in my pocket for a while. And you don't need very much. It'll just drizzle some of that in there. and that'll be enough. Now let's take a close-up look at how much I put in here. And you can see I drizzled that molasses over there, and that isn't very much. So now we've got our charcoal going, we've got our pineapple in here, now let's start mixing our cake mix. Now the recipe says that we want a third cup of vegetable oil. Okay, well what I'm going to do, is put some margarine in there. Cut 
that in with our pastry blender. This will add some moisture to the cake. I think it adds a little bit of flavor to it. Sometimes when people see me put the margarine in there, they'll declare it to be poison and then they won't eat it, so it's more for me. Mixy, 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 mixy. And when cutting things in with a pastry blender, you see how I push in and turn, push in and turn. Okay, I'm sure there's other techniques. But this is something you can't do halfway. You really got to get that cut in there. There we go. And, as I demonstrated before, wipe this thing off. Okay, then we need three eggs. Now, it is a little embarrassing that I've never mastered that thing of being able to crack an egg with one hand, but I have never been able to do that. Okay, and it says one cup of water. And we won't put in the whole third cup of vegetable oil, but we'll put in a little. About that much. And we'll mix it. There we go. just about right. Another thing I'll do is before I go anywhere else, I'll wipe this off. Obviously we'll wash it off later. But in just this minute, I'll get as much of this off here as I can. Okay. And then we will put this on top of our pineapple. Now it depends on how tall your Dutch oven is, but what you might run into is you put in the cake mix and you don't want to use all of it because that'll rise enough it'll get too close to the top and burn the top of the cake. So I know I'm not going to be able to use all of this. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to estimate about two cupcakes worth of batter in the bowl. Okay, let's hedge our bet just a little. There we go. Put our lid on. And let's get this on our heat. Okay, we've got our charcoal going. Normally we put a lot more heat on the top than on the bottom, but in this case, The pineapple will keep our cake from burning on the bottom. So we'll put more charcoal on the bottom than we typically would. Still not what you'd call a lot, but more than typical. Okay. Make sure when you go down to one knee like that, you don't put your knee on a charcoal briquette. No, I've never done that with my knee. Done it with a hand. That's a lot of charcoal on the top. And what you don't want to do is burn the top of your cake. And a lot of times the fruit on the bottom cakes like this will take longer to cook than a, a regular cake would. And that's okay. 
good cake in 30 minutes is a whole lot better than burned cake in 20 minutes. Get our heat going around here. Okay, and we'll give this to start with about 20 minutes and then we'll check it. So we have our cake going. I just started some more charcoal for what will be our main course. And let's see what our main course is going to be. Well, any good main course is gonna start with bacon. Now, anytime I'm cooking any kind of meat, I want to line the bottom of the big Dutch oven with bacon because not only will it add flavor and people always like bacon, but this will allow the bacon to be burned and the main course won't be. Dutch oven with bacon. And I know you're just waiting in anticipation of what the main course will be. And this comes actually from a viewer request. The main course is going to be Cornish game hens. Now, I don't claim any kind of expertise on the subject, but as near as I can tell, a Cornish game hen is basically a miniature chicken. And we're going to put these in here. They don't have giblets. We have four of them. Now, an interesting anecdote that comes with Cornish game hens is, as a little kid, I mean when I was like seven or eight, go to the grocery with my mom, and I'd see these things, and they're frozen, and they're wrapped in that shrink wrap plastic like a turkey. So it looks just like a frozen turkey, but it's about the size of your fist. And I could read Cornish game hen. Mom, what's a Cornish game hen? And I don't remember her exact answer, but the only thing I remember really clearly is my mom got really mad. But anyway, Cornish game hens can be pretty good if they're cooked properly, so let's see if we can cook them properly. And what we're going to do is put them in here, put a couple of strips of bacon on the top of them, and then We'll put them in the charcoal and we'll let them bake for about 25 minutes. And then we'll add our vegetables and so forth. The charcoal we're going to use for our Cornish game hens isn't quite ready yet. So let's check on our cake. Perfect. And we didn't burn the top of the cake. So again, Jump off the dust, put that back in there, and get it off the heat. Okay, now let's check on the charcoal for the Cornish game hens. Now the big Dutch oven has legs on it, but they're kind of pokey legs, and so when I put it on the ground, especially in this soft dirt, it's going to sink, and we don't want the bottom of the Dutch oven actually touching the charcoal. So I'll put these pieces of particle board on the ground. And I'll put the legs on those. And because this ground is kind of wet, it's going to absorb some of our heat. So we'll have more of our charcoal on the bottom than we typically would. And remember, of course, we have the bacon to insulate this. There we go. Then we Dutch oven on there, and it can be kind of a tricky process to make sure all the legs are where they're supposed to be. There we go. It can be a tricky process on a good day. And 
That of course is not nearly enough charcoal for the top, so we'll fire up some more. While we're waiting for our charcoal to fire up and our Cornish game hens to bake, let's see how our cake turned out. And we'll start with a close-up of what it looks like. Here's our cake, and you can see the holes in it where the pineapple and pineapple juice was boiling and volcanoing through. So our cake is not bakery display window perfect. But of course, the proof of the pudding, or in this case the cake, is in the eating. So let's give it a try. The consistency seems to be very good. And of course, the first piece is difficult to get out, so it often ends up crumbling. But what we see is that it is not sticking to the bottom of the pan and doesn't appear to be burned in the least and it's still nice and warm and you see what i mean how you have cake with lots of pineapple as opposed to just a couple of chunks so let's give it a try mm. This could be eaten cold, but I'm going to recommend eating it warm. And I don't want to raw raw too much, but I got to say that turned out perfectly. And while our birds are cooking, we'll chop up some vegetables. Now what I've got is some red potatoes and some white potatoes or yellow potatoes or something. And I'll cut them into fairly small pieces makes them easier to serve, and it just makes them cook faster. Something that ends up happening is that quite often I end up with too many vegetables and too many potatoes, but that's okay. If you have too much food, it's not a big crisis. It's when you don't have enough that that's no fun at all. Bear with me if I've told this anecdote before, but I go to black powder rendezvous, and cooking in the Dutch oven, sleeping in the teepee, that kind of thing. And typically you have a potluck. Okay. Well, have you ever been to a potluck where they ran out of food? Well, up until this point, I hadn't been. And since I went there and I brought one person with me, and we made the small cauldron full of chili, and then we made some bacon and beans and made something else. So the two of us brought enough food for probably 15 or 20 people. And they ended up running out of food anyway, because there was one camp where every cousin and in-law they ever had showed up. So they brought about 20 people and brought enough food for maybe three or four. Which, by the way, if you go to a potluck, that's not cool. But that's what they did. And it really... I was very put out by that. And since a group of people did that, then another group of people did something very similar. We ended up with running out of food. And... I saw somebody that got there a little late. Yeah, and I know, snooze you lose, but got there a little late. And he ends up digging through that big uh, Dutch oven I have, looking for the remnants of whatever, which of course there wasn't any. And he has a piece of bread and he's picking the bacon off the bottom of the Dutch oven, you know, the stuff that's there just to be burned, and whatever little gravy is left, putting it on his bread. Now, that's bad enough that they brought ten people and they brought enough food for two. And it's bad enough when a potluck runs out of food. But if you've ever been in the military, you might understand this. For me, as a platoon sergeant, Part of my job is to make sure everybody gets enough food, that I'm sitting there and seeing this guy, no food left at a potluck? That really, really bothered me. And so the following year, 
I said, okay, bag it. And I brought the 20 gallon cauldron and we cooked a giant pot of chili and then took a whole bunch of different hot dogs and sausages and put in there and put that next to a table with Tabasco sauce, hot dog buns and all that. And so, be damned, there was enough food for everybody. So my point comes back to too much food, not a crisis. Too little, that can really suck. Now, someone suggested that I put a fruit glaze over the, over the Cornish game hens. Yeah, I've tried a couple of different ones, didn't like anything like that. But what we are going to do is just chop up some fruit. Now, this is an apple, not a potato, for those who couldn't see it clearly. And although when I eat an apple, I typically eat the core, most people are not going to want apple cores with their Cornish game hen. Also very important if you get the apple that comes with a little sticker on it. Got to make sure that you leave the apple core for the deer. Got to make sure you get that sticker off of there. And some people are surprised when they get their vegetables, bite into it, and discover that what they thought was a potato wedge is actually an apple wedge. And some people are pleasantly surprised, and some people are not. But Since I'm going to eat this myself, I won't be surprised. Okay, now let's go check on our hens. Okay, our birds have been cooking for about 30 minutes. So, let's take the lid off very, very carefully. And those are looking pretty good. So we will add our fruits and vegetables. put all those around the birds, nothing on top of the birds. And I mentioned earlier not wanting to put a fruit type glaze, but I'm going to try putting some molasses on our birds. And as I said before, you don't need much. With the experimental nature of this, I'm going to put molasses only on two of the birds. Hedge my bets a little. Then, put all of our stuff in there. And we'll put the bacon on. And, as I've said before, the heat will come down from the top, cook the bacon. The bacon will then the grease will drip through all of our fruits and vegetables, and they will cook in the bacon grease. And of course, the bacon will just add to the whole meal anyway. And our charcoal has been going for quite a while, and there's a lot of heat in that still, but it is getting old. 
and we'll fire up some more charcoal to put both on the top and the bottom of this. Okay, once we have that, then we carefully, carefully put the lid back on and let's fire up some more charcoal. Okay, we've had our vegetables and so forth in there for 40 minutes. And I can hear them cooking away in there. I've also replaced this charcoal. Carefully take that off. Bacon looks crisp. Let's check our yams. Potatoes and yams cooked, but just a little bit al dente. So might want to give those a few more minutes. But that depends on what condition our birds are in. And oh, bird meat is falling off the bone. This is the stuff that does not have the molasses on it. Mmm, perfect. So, looks like what we should have done was put in our vegetables about 10 minutes sooner. But that's okay. Since I like vegetables that are a little bit al dente, that's going to work just fine. Now, make sure that that's back on all the way. And we'll take this off the heat. <clears throat> and then we'll dish it up and see how it turned out. Now, before I dish up some of this, I'm going to give you a chance to see a close-up of what it looks like in the Dutch oven. And here we see our bacon on top is kind of crisp. Some of it is not so crisp for people who like it limp. Our potatoes are done, but if you look at this yam, you can see that that's cooked, but still not mushy. And if you dig all this away, here's our birds. Now these two are the ones that had the molasses on them, and it looks like most of the molasses just washed away. But there's our bird. So let's put him on the plate. So we have our molasses bird on the plate. And I didn't put any salt and pepper on them in the cooking process because I knew a lot of it would wash off, so we'll put a little salt on there now. And put a little pepper. There we go. And we'll get some bacon. And a piece of pineapple. I can find one. I really want to see how our baked apples turned out. Uh, and just visually, it can be hard to tell the difference between the apple and the potato. There's an apple. And we'll try a piece of yam. Okay. Now, mm, the apple is hot, but still just a little bit of crunchiness to it. And it's taken on some of the flavors of the bacon and so forth. So I'm gonna call that an acquired taste, which I'm not sure if I've acquired. The yam. Now see, for me, that's perfect. The bacon I don't really need to try. Good. Okay. Let's try our molasses. Our molasses drizzled Cornish game hen. That is cooked perfectly. Bone just came right out of the leg. Not the breast meat is not dry. Mm. 
Mm. I have to say this. Tastes like chicken. And I also have to say, I think the glasses all ran off. I can't taste it at all. But if we wanted to do the meat and fruit thing, okay, I'll get some meat off of here. And I'll eat the meat and the pineapple. And that is two great tastes that do not taste great together. I would say, if I were to make a recommendation, the apples in here, great, but any kind of fruit glaze with this, that probably won't work out real well. But altogether, I gotta say that turned out pretty good. Okay, let's cook one more thing. We're going to make chili cornbread or cornbread chili. That's where we make a pot of chili, put it in the Dutch oven, and then put the cornbread mix on top of it and bake the whole thing. Now it comes with three very important caveats. Right now the cauldron of chili is sitting on the Coleman stove and it's cooking. Typically I would have the cauldron hanging over a fire. My apologies, but I have to use the stove because I'm in no condition to build and maintain a fire and cook over it. Now secondly, I'm not going to show you the process of cooking the chili. We've already done that on a previous Thanksgiving special. And third, the chili has five main ingredients. One, various spices. Two, tomato sauce. Three, diced tomatoes. Four, ground beef. And five, kidney beans. Now, when I've made chili like this before, there seems to be two factions that are just disturbed by this. One of the factions writes me comments that's something to the effect of, Paul, you put beans in chili? Chili doesn't have beans, you ruined it. <laughs> then there's the other faction that's, Paul, chili is just beans. You put meat in chili? You ruined it. <laughs> okay, if you're in either of those factions, all I can say to you is, get over it. Now, let's take a close-up look at the cauldron of chili. And here's our chili. And you can see that I'm using both dark red and light red kidney beans. They're slightly different in texture, and it just makes for a better presentation. Now we've browned the ground beef, put it in here, mixed all our ingredients, got that getting fairly warm. And now put the lid on there and let that simmer for a while. And now let's mix up our cornbread batter. I'm going to use Jiffy Mix. Jiffy Mix I found really pretty good. And just easy to work with. I'm going to use three boxes of it. And as always, don't throw the box in the fire until you're done. You still need the instructions. And the instructions say that I need one egg and one third cup of milk. So three boxes, I need three eggs. third cup of milk, so that's one cup of milk. This can is 12 ounces, a cup is 8 ounces. So we'll use about two-thirds of the can. Don't over mix your mix. Got to get it blended, but not too much. Don't wait until I need more. That's a pretty good consistency, but I want to be able to pour it over the chili. So I'm going to put in a little more. There we go. 
And of course, before I started this process, I already started heating up our charcoal. There we go. And that's about the consistency that I'm going to want. Okay. Now, let's go get our Dutch oven. And now let's put it together. Now that might seem like a lot of chili for this pan, but remember, we want chili with cornbread. Not cornbread flavored with a little bit of chili. Okay. Smooth that out a little bit. And for dishes like this, just like with the pineapple upside down cake, we put what seemed like too much pineapple. A lot of times when it seems like too much, it might not be enough. And we'll take our cornbread mix. And put that on there. See, that's still just a little bit thick. That's okay, as it starts to cook, it'll spread out. Now, also, in the way of, gotta get your excuses out of the way before you ruin it. Please remember that I've never tried this before. I'm just pretty much winging it. So, we'll see what happens. of a prediction. I'm going to say that instead of coming out as a cake with chili under it, it's probably going to come out more like a tub of chili with cornbread dumplings in it. Okay, let's put that on our charcoal. Okay, our charcoal is just about ready. Now, typically in baking any kind of cake or something like that, you want most of your heat on the top. But in this case, a lot of that heat has to go through the chili to bake our cornbread stuff. So we're going to put more heat on the bottom. And that is a lot of heat. Temperature today is about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. All of a sudden, wow, I'm feeling warm. That is a lot of heat. And we'd have to concern ourselves with this burning the top of our cornbread before the rest of it gets baked. But in this case, it's not that close to the top. But I'm still gonna tell you, I'm going to take off just a few of these coals. There we go. Okay. And we'll take some of these, put them over here on the windward side. There isn't too much wind today, just a little breeze. But we'll still put some of these over here. So when the breeze blows this direction, it blows some heat into what we're baking. And I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but wind can be a big factor in your cooking time and how many coals you need. Okay. So I'm going to start with setting that for about 20 minutes.
Let's see how we do. Now, while we're waiting for that to bake, we have to take a moment to talk about corporate sponsors. Sometimes people see ads like this. <laughs> When people see that, they think that we're sponsored by Kellogg's. Kellogg's has never heard of me. We just do that for fun. We do not have any corporate sponsors. I find that if you have corporate sponsors, it costs you credibility. And I'm really not very good at endorsing things. Let me show you a couple of attempts we made at endorsing things. Hi, Paul Harrell here for Abby's Legendary Pizza. Legendary in food preparation, like Typhoid Mary. What was wrong with that take? Hi, Paul Harrell here for Abby's Legendary Pizza. Legendary in food preparation, like Lucrecia Borgia. What was wrong with that? People sometimes ask if I barbecue the meat target components. Well, when I buy meat that I plan on eating, I shop at Safeway. But when I buy meat that I'm going to shoot, I shop at Walmart. Yeah, doing advertisements, not for me. We do not have any corporate sponsors. Okay, let's go see how our chili cornbread's doing. Okay, it's been 20 minutes, and yes, I've changed jackets. Let's see how we're progressing. And that looks pretty good. And it's just about one step short of done, and that's okay because the heat in that Dutch oven will keep it going. So, we'll take the heat off. Then we'll take the Dutch oven off the heat, and we'll give that a few minutes to cool off. Okay, our Dutch oven has cooled off a little bit. Let's take a close-up look at what our chili cornbread looks like. And let's take a look. And that looks really good. And it didn't stick to the sides. Let's see if we can dish up some of this. And it's kind of like a chili cobbler. And that's what it looks like. Now, while this was still on the charcoal, I put the knife in in a couple of places, and it came out pretty well clean, so it looked like this was baked sufficiently. And even after I take it off the heat, there's enough heat in this Dutch oven that if it wasn't, it should bake through. However, now that I've dished this up, there's a couple of places where it isn't quite done on the bottom. So what I should have done was taken the charcoal off the top, because the top is most certainly done, put more under it to get more heat through that chili to cook the bottom of our cornbread. It's not terrible, but it could be baked just a little more. I'm going to eat it. Okay. I would really like to stand here and tell you how great it is, but I gotta say, I like chili, and I like cornbread, but for me, these are two great tastes that do not taste great together. Okay, we're going to do something. Please keep in mind, I'm doing this by request, and we're going to do the short version, because although you might find the short version interesting, the long version is horrible. But before we do that, you notice I've changed jackets. Now I have several of these hunting coats. They have lots of pockets. They're very practical. But this little pocket up here, some people have suggested that this pocket is made to carry a pack of cigarettes. Okay, the problem is the pocket is too short to carry a pack of cigarettes unless what you're carrying are Camel non-filters. Now, I'm not much of a smoking man. don't have any real expertise on the subject, but people tell me that Camel non-filters actually is where the good tobacco is. So if I were going to come up with a slogan for these, it would be something like, Camel non-filters, 
when you don't even pretend that you care, and when you're willing to pay the exorbitant price to get the good cigarette tobacco. You packed my bags last night, pre-flight. Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high, high, high as a kite by then. I miss the earth so much. I miss my wife. It's lonely out in space. On such a time, high, high, let's flight. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time till touchdown brings me round again to find. I'm not the man they think I am at home. Oh, no, no, no. <sighs> no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man. Burning out his fuse up here. Alone. Frequently in the presentation that I do, I will tell anecdotes. An anecdote is a story that's intended to make a point. Well, with the Thanksgiving special, I will tell stories that aren't necessarily intended to make any point except to take up time and perhaps be interesting, and whether or not they're interesting can be debatable. Well, today I'm going to tell a story, or a couple of them, and if they have any point, the point will be to illustrate why I very infrequently tell military-related anecdotes. Now. People in the military love to tell stories about what they did in the military. I don't. In fact, I tell military-related stories so infrequently that a lot of people take that as a sign of I must not have ever really been in the military because I don't talk about it constantly. Okay. The thing is, when I tell military-related stories, they are infrequent, short, and boring because they happen to be true. A lot of people who tell military-related stories follow the 90-90 rule. That is, 90% of what they tell you is 90% fiction. It happens occasionally that I will meet somebody who was just a one four-year enlistment kind of person, and he'll tell so much stuff that it will become amazing how he could accomplish all of that. Now, I was in for 20 years. Four years active duty in the Marine Corps, 16 years in the National Guard, I did a tour in the Middle East in the late war. I'm a master fitness trainer. I'm a U.S. Army Distinguished Rifleman. I've been to air assault school, uh, cold weather training, hot weather training, jungle operations training. I was in New Orleans for the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, blah, blah, blah. Now, a colleague of mine, Sergeant First Class Cave, he was actually in for 21 years. That's just how his enlistments shook out. All right. He was active duty Army and National Guard. He was at NTC. He did some kind of peacekeeping blue helmet thing in the Middle East. He did two tours, excuse me, not in the Middle East, in Europe. He did two tours in the Middle East in the recent war, airborne school, on and on and on. So between the two of us, we have over 40 years in and have done a fair amount of stuff. And it's common that I will meet somebody who has one four-year enlistment, and he's done more in that four years than the two of us have done in our combined 40. That's because people like that follow the 90-90 rule. A really good example is one of the crew that I refer to as the lieutenant colonel, or sometimes for short, just the colonel, was in for 20 years, initial enlistment in the active duty Navy. And I got to tell you, she's about the only sailor I ever met that wasn't a SEAL. Such is the nature of military anecdotes. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of military stories today. And they come with a couple of very important caveats. One is, 
I do not have time to refilm this segment many times before I get it right. So you're going to have to put up with me tripping over words, transposing words and syllables, my Shatner-esque pauses and everything else. And please understand this won't be the Shakespearean, highly polished presentation that you're accustomed to. Now, the other thing is that as I tell this story, for those of you who have some problem with Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds, let me make this clear. I'm talking about what happened on a training exercise. It was not in real battle. It was a training exercise. Okay. And here it goes. We're at JOTC in, excuse me, JRTC in Louisiana. It's summertime. It's hot. Talk about 90, 90. Yeah, the temperature was over 90 Fahrenheit and the humidity was over 90. It was miserable. And what we're doing is a brigade level exercise where they really do put a lot of effort into making it as real as they can without live ammo. And we're supposed to be in a country with some kind of, of insurgency going on and they never use the words Vietnam, but they try to make it a lot like that. And the op four, that's opposing forces, the op four is everywhere. And you have people playing the role of civilians in that country and they're out there in just civilian clothes with the miles gear on you know, the military laser system and it's really some pretty good training or at least it can be now the op four there are of course american military personnel and so they're using the same ta-50 that we are the same m16 series rifles the difference between us is that we are wearing the woodland camouflage uniform and they're wearing the old green BDUs. And although I would tell you that American woodland camo is, in my opinion, among the very, very best camouflage uniform designs, at that time of year in that part of the country where you have a lot of sunshine and a lot of rain and a lot of heat, everything is lush and green. The grass is green. The leaves are green. And the Op 4 people were telling us that they were of the opinion that the green uniform they were wearing was in that environment superior to the camouflage pattern we were wearing. And I got to say, they were probably right. Okay. Now you get into a situation like that, and the Op 4 always has a lot of advantages in that they live there. They know the terrain. They don't need maps and compasses and anything like that. They're also sometimes fed information on where we are just so battles can occur. We never know where they are. And they have a lot of advantages. Okay, so on this particular day, we leave the battalion area. We're going on a company level operation. So we have the infantry company and attached to us is a transportation company with five ton trucks. We all get in the trucks, go out to where they're going to drop us off. Now at the time I was a staff sergeant and I was the weapons squad leader. Okay, well, we do our typical, get off the trucks and immediately take some kind of perimeter and sit there and wait for word to move out. When we do that, it is common, not just at that exercise, but for the entire time I was in the National Guard, it was common that we would sit there for an hour or two. You should only be sitting there for a few minutes, but we'd sit there for an hour or two. And this was no exception. When you're in a situation like that, even if you're only planning on being there a few minutes, you're supposed to get out your e-tool and dig a hasty fighting position, just something that you can lay down in. We never do that. And the OCs, observer controller, the people that are controlling this and evaluating us, they're kind of telling me how lazy and stupid I am and all the troops are because we're not doing this. And I'm trying to explain to them, we know we're supposed to, but we never do because every soldier here knows that he's only going to be sitting there for three or four minutes before someone comes along and moves him. I don't mean we get up and move out. I mean, someone just moves him 10 feet down. Well, you're, yes, I know we should, but we're not going to dig five holes before somebody finally puts us where we're supposed to be. And right about then, someone came up and said, no, don't, don't be online here. Be online over there. And we move, and then later we moved again. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Well, that goes on for a few times. Okay, finally we're settled. And we sit there for an hour plus, presumably while we're waiting for someone at battalion to figure out which way is up. We spend a lot of time waiting on that. Okay, well about then the Op 4 calls in artillery on us. Now the way they do that 
is they get a hold of the, I forget what he's called, the artillery guy, and they say, we're calling in a mortar strike on this grid coordinates, to which he says, okay, and he plugs them into his GPS, gets on his quad cycle, drives out to those grid coordinates, then pulls out some arty sims, which are just giant firecrackers, throws them around, boom, boom, and then says, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And that's what they did to us. Okay. And then we just sit there. You know, that should be a good clue. It's time to move out. But no, we just sit there for about two more hours. So one of my troops comes up to me and, and asks me, what are we doing? What are we waiting for? And I told him, well, most likely we're waiting for someone at battalion to figure out which way is up. I probably didn't use that exact phrasing. But I'll go find out. At least I'll try. So I go on up the line, and I'm asking, where's the platoon commander? I don't know. Where's the platoon commander? I don't know. Finally, I get up the line a ways and discover the platoon commander has been declared dead. Oh, okay. Where's the platoon sergeant? Now, I remember I was a staff sergeant squad leader at the time. Oh, he's dead too. Oh, okay. Thanks for sharing. So I go over to the next platoon. Where's the CO? Where's the company commander? I don't know. <sighs> Finally, after a while of wandering around, I find the company commander's RTO, who is sitting there, which is kind of amazing he could do that, considering just how far up his ass his head was. But he then informs me that, oh, the company commander, the XO, the first sergeant, and the other platoon commanders have all been declared dead. Really? Were you planning on telling that little fact to anybody? Oh, <laughs> all right. That put me in a position where I had to ask a question. And I'm telling you, this is a question that if anybody ever asks it, your operation is in big trouble. And not only did I have to ask it, but my position in the pecking order of who was of all the E6s that were there. I was down far enough there were several people, like about seven, that should have asked it before I did. And the question I had to ask was, who's in charge here? And the answer I got was a bunch of looks that looked like this. Now, some of you are already thinking this, the movie Apocalypse Now. A lot of people in the military watch it. I'm going to say it should be required watching. Where Captain Willard goes into this military unit and everything's going to pieces and he asks some private, where's the C? Oh no, who's the CO? Who's the CO? And the private looks at him, ain't you? <laughs> that popped into my mind. <sighs> okay. Now, when you have a bunch of people, and there were several staff sergeants there, when you have a bunch of people that are the same rank, determining who is the senior one is based on who has been that rank the longest. And it's also determined by what position in the company that you hold. At that time, it would be in a platoon, the first squad leader, regardless of how long he'd been, whatever rank, would take over for the platoon sergeant, and then the second, and then the third, that kind of thing. So I'm pretty far down in the pecking order of this whole thing, considering that there's also squad leaders from, from other platoons. And so when I ask who's in charge and everybody looks at me, Duh. I finally had to say, okay, I guess I'm in charge, to which everybody was okay with that. Now, the thing you have to understand is that there's a lot of people that are all eager to be in charge if it's a simple task, like getting everybody to the chow hall for breakfast. But in this case, it looked like it was gonna be a daunting task, and we have all these people evaluating us. And so, what you do at this particular moment is going to have a significant impact on how the entire company and even the entire battalion gets rated by the people who are rating us. It can really affect your career. So although I say this is a training exercise, it wasn't real, yeah, there were some real implications to what decisions are made by whoever's in charge. So a lot of people just didn't want to be in charge. Okay, so now that we've established I'm in charge, 
I get a hold of the senior staff sergeant with the transportation unit and I ask him, I oh, know, man, I was, I gotta tell you, I was biting my nails to ask him this. Do you know where we are? Oh yeah, sure he does. And he pulls out, oh, I'm, we're right here. Okay, do you know where we need to be? Oh yeah, we need, do you know how to get there? Oh, sure I do. Good, everybody get on the damn trucks and let's get out of here. Now, you have to deal with some regulations and some academic things outside the training exercise, such as regulations say that only a certain number of people can be on a five ton truck. Okay, yeah, in real life, we'd probably stretch that number, but in this case, we couldn't. And so obviously if we could, we would take the dead bodies with us. But in this case, I had to say, okay, we can't take them because of safety regulations, but what I would really do is take all of them and stack them like cordwood on one truck. Okay. And even if you had to leave dead bodies behind, you'd certainly police up their weapons. But in this case, for accountability, we just couldn't. Those people who were declared dead had to be left with their weapons. All right. So and we've got the administrative part of it take, taken care of. Get on the trucks. Go. And we go and we get back to the battalion area and everything's fine. Well, the next day, when we meet up with those dead people who've now been magically resurrected, they told me that, yeah, the Op 4 came in en masse just moments before ENT, and they would have certainly killed us all. I mean, we would have been at a terrible disadvantage, again, them knowing the terrain, us not, uh, our force having most of our leadership taken out of it. And so getting out of there was obviously the right thing to do. What also happened the next day is no one talked to me, but you could hear people talking, yeah, I don't know about that, leaving the people behind. I guess they missed what I said. And of course, the people who were those who should have taken charge, remember that, that thing about the four guys named everybody, anybody, somebody, and nobody? Yeah, it was everybody should have, somebody could have, <laughs> anybody could have and ended up nobody actually did it. Yeah, the people who should have taken charge were all, the only thing they could do was bitch about the way I did it. And I can't even imagine what 90-90 version of that got told at battalion. Now, as I tell this, if I sound like I'm bugged, I am. I gotta tell you, something else that went through my mind was Remember, this is a training exercise, it's not real. But because there can be implications for your career and the well-being of the unit and things like that, it kind of is real. And if you'd say, I'm not in charge and don't do anything, that's not going to get looked at as much as being in charge and doing something. And what went through my mind was, in one of the documentaries I've seen, there was this letter that was written home by a soldier during the Civil War, and he said something to the effect of, every schoolyard bully you ever saw is an abject coward when it comes to real battle. Yeah, in what little um, experience I have on two-way ranges, I can, I can certainly agree with that. And you see the same thing here. All these people that want to be large and in charge any other time were perfectly okay with not doing anything. And I gotta tell you, my fellow NCOs really let me down and I was very saddened and disgusted by the whole thing. Now, when we talk about military stories like this, another thing we have to look at is one of my colleagues that was there, that was in my squad at the time, Staff Sergeant Schaefer, at the time he was a specialist, he was the M60 gunner. You should hear him tell the exact same story I just told. His version is, I gotta say, significantly different than mine. Now, if you listen to him tell it, and you talk about the facts that, you know, like we were here for an hour, we were there for two hours, we did this and I said that, and all these other things. His facts are the same as mine. He doesn't exaggerate or embellish at all. The difference is, while I sit here with this sour look on my face telling you how sad and disappointed I was, he makes it sound like it was really cool. Oh yeah, and everybody was dead, so Paul did this and Paul did that, and well, he got us out of there and it was really cool and we overcame, man, that was... And so, he makes it sound like 
improvise, adapt, and overcome, and we were successful, I make it sound like uh, one of the darkest days of my military career. A lot of the story is in the way it's told. Now, I don't want this to end on a negative note, so let me tell you another story about another time where we were coming up in another place against a different Op 4. Same kind of thing. They know the area. We don't. They are told where we are. We don't know where they are. And so we're doing a movement contact. We make contact. And yeah, the problem is we're on a flat ground with bushes and trees. Not really, not really heavy vegetation, but enough that they have a lot of concealment, which with Miles gear, concealment and cover are the same thing. And so they're moving and we can't find them. Yeah, except somebody from an adjacent company was up on a big hill over here and he could just see everything. And so they're up there and they start using a really high-tech communication system, which is yelling at us. Hey, they're about 50 meters in front of you, four of them. Wait, they're cutting to your left. <laughs> and so we were able to outmaneuver the op four and we whooped them pretty damn badly all because of somebody took some initiative and, and used a really high-tech thing like yelling. So that was what we call a red letter day of people just improvising, adapting, and overcoming. Now, I'm gonna tell you one other anecdote that's military related. When my daughter was in Air Force ROTC, I went to some function they were having, I don't remember what it was, and all the cadets were doing this and that, it was their Christmas party or something, I don't, I don't recall. My daughter was put in charge of National Anthem, and I told her, okay, the National Anthem is always screwed up, every time. So you gotta check it, check it again, and make sure nobody else does anything with it. Okay, and she did, and went off fine. A year later, when I went to her graduation, where they were all getting their lieutenant's bars pinned on, she wasn't in charge of the National Anthem. And I was telling the Colonel, yeah, the National Anthem will be screwed up. Okay, and at the time where they said, okay, I'll rise to the National Anthem, we all stand up. And nothing happens. We stand there for about 10 seconds, all looking at each other. And then one of these Air Force cadets that's now been a lieutenant for about 20 minutes, <laughs> he just... Oh, say, can you see? And he just starts singing it. And we all join in and everybody sings it. I'm telling you, I don't know if that guy will make general or anything, but that's the kind of officer you want leading you. If somebody looks around, this is dicked up, what do I do? And he takes charge and does something. That is another thing that we call a red letter day in the military. Okay, let's take a look at something else. Well, that about wraps it up. Now, at the end of last year's Thanksgiving special, I introduced you to Vodka, the Borzoi, also known as a Russian wolfhound. Well, now he's a year older and he's grown into quite a good dog. He's still on a leash because out here, if he sees one of our local deer, he'll chase it and you're not getting him back until he feels like coming back. Now, if you're wondering about the wookalar you hear in the background, Buckley, Buckley, come here. This is Buckley, the Bernese mountain dog. And he doesn't need a leash when he's out here. And he's over five years old. And puffing like that is just part of what we're going to do. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and he really wants to get back in the pickup. So, if you've watched this whole thing, thank you for your attention, and happy Thanksgiving.